Well, good morning, Foursquare. We're so glad you're with us this morning. And I don't know about you, but it's so good to be able to declare that truth, that even in the midst of everything that's going on, going on in our world, our God is unstoppable. There is no God like our God. And he is the one who reigns on the throne. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. And so we invite you this morning to come, to stand, to worship him, to praise him. And you know, I I just believe strongly in this season that we need to have a heart of anticipation, a heart to say, okay, God, we're in this. This has been a crazy year, but we know that in the midst of this year, in the midst of all that's going on, you are still moving. And so we invite you to just worship with that expectation that our God is still on the throne, that he's still moving. Amen. So let's worship him. Let's praise his name together.
you never leave us nor forsake us, God. We invite you, Lord, into our lives, into our hearts this morning. Lord, and we say that we are grateful that you've already bought our freedom. You've already paid the price. And so we come to you, Lord, recognizing you are all we need. In the midst of everything, God, you are our rock and our foundation.
Scripture says that we need to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And so, Lord, we say, open our eyes and open our ears. That we would recognize you, that you are with us in this time. That you have not left us, you have not abandoned us. God, you are with us and you will never leave us. So meet us again in this place, God. As we stand, as we declare your praise, God, meet us here. And Lord, may we recognize that every day, that you are with us. Meet us in this place, Lord. We praise your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you uh, for worshiping with us this morning. And we're going to continue to worship at this time by receiving uh, the tithes and offerings. And there are three ways that you can give. Uh, You can go to our website and set that up um, online. Or you can do a bill pay or check and mail it to the address or text to that number there on the screen. And we just want to thank you again for those of you who faithfully give every single week and uh, just give to what God is doing in this community. So we want to thank you. Let's pray over that uh, this morning. Father, we thank you, God, that, Lord, everything, Lord, everything we can imagine, Lord, everything we, we look to, everything in this world, God, is still in your hands. And so, Lord, we look to you at this time, and we recognize you are faithful and true. And so, God, may our worship, may our giving honor you and lift up your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, we have a few announcements for you this morning before we move on. So go ahead and watch this. Good morning. Whether you are watching at one of our One Church sites, online, at home, or listening in your car, no matter where you are, we are thrilled to have you join us today. Please take a moment to complete our Connect card at foursquarechurch.info. We would love to connect with you. Ladies, the tent talks are now done for the season, and what a great time those have been. For the winter months, we're going to be starting table talks. These will have a relaxed cafe feel. We'll begin with warm soup and have some live music, followed by an encouraging message, and then some life-giving discussion around the tables. Our first table talk will be November 17th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Please register at foursquarechurch.info by Sunday the 15th. We are super excited to be returning to live in-person services Sunday, November 15th at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Stay tuned to social media, email, and our website for all the details. The Holy Spirit is definitely the most overlooked and misunderstood person of the Trinity. Jesus said it is his very spirit that he enabled by his death and resurrection to live within each person who follows Christ. The Holy Spirit weekend is not just informational, listening to teaching, it's experiential. You'll have impactful conversations with others as well as experience the Holy Spirit for yourself as leaders and pastors pray over you and share what they believe the Holy Spirit is saying just for you. You don't want to miss this opportunity. To join us for this event, sign up at foursquarechurch.info. Well, hello, everyone. Good to see you again this week. We're glad to have you joining us. I cannot tell you just how much anticipation and excitement I have to be able to see some of you in person next week. I can't believe it. Next Sunday. Uh, Please know for the rest of you who maybe don't feel comfortable to come yet or don't live in our area, man, we love you just as much. We will continue to bring you our services at 8.30 and 10.30 every week. It's not that I love some more than another. I just love the thought that somebody will be in this room while I'm speaking again. How great will that be? 
It is going to be wonderful. We are looking forward to it. And in conjunction with that, I mentioned in my weekly video uh, this week, if you didn't see that, um, just know right now that one of the uh, priorities, objectives that we've been focusing on for a couple months as a church while we um, suspended these in-person services, one of the big things was creating a church app. And we have now completed that, and we were going to continue to improve it for sure. This is our first go around, but it is now available. And all the platforms with your phones or or uh, iPads, tablets, whatever, uh, wherever you can load your apps, you will be able to find it. Of course, on all the main things, um, Google Play and, and the App Store, just search for Gettysburg Foursquare Church and you'll find it. You should see our logo. And why that's important is, even though you saw in those announcements about going to our website to sign up, you can now already, as you get this app, begin to do everything from there. Everything. So that means signing up for events, uh, that means watching our services on Sunday, whether live streaming it or later on demand, uh, giving online. Um, you can give through there. You see all of our announcements. We're going to send you the bulletin through that on Sundays here as we begin to move back in. And so you want to get our church app. It is going to be a great tool for you and resource. We'll be able to send you notifications when different things are happening, weather alerts, all those things. So get that church app. And also, as you've been hearing, and you'll be seen in different places, especially if you're a parent coming from our kids' department, that is how you pre-register your kids for Sundays. We're not registering or pre-registering adults for our Sunday services at this point. We think we can manage all of that, but we don't want to go over capacity since we're coming back with reduced capacity in each of our rooms in our kids' department. So you have to pre-register your kids. There'll be a cutoff in those services, so don't wait till Saturday night in each of the different classrooms and the different services for your kids. We want to make sure that they're safe, uh, that you're safe, and that we can continue uh, worshiping on Sundays and not allow anything to, to get into, into the way of that as best as we can. So, um, so I'm excited to see some of you here next week. It'll just make me feel like I'm with all of you, just having some people here in the room. Uh, <clears throat> if you don't know this, we've been filming now for several months on Thursdays, Thursdays which then get released to you, whether uh, if you're at a one church on a Saturday night or you watch it on a Sunday or you watch it throughout the week. But that means this week that right now as I'm speaking, we are still in this place of waiting to know what the final election results are. And I just say that because um, I wish I could say something or, or be able to just relate to that um, live with you this weekend if we even know by then. But we we are still waiting and, and praying. And listen, as I've been saying here for several weeks, trusting God no matter the outcome. Um, our, our, we all have preferences and those things are good and we, and we should, we should uh, be glad for how God directs us. But, but it, as we're still waiting for those final results, it's a great reminder that Jesus is King and that he is on the throne. And I pray that uh, you are able to pull yourself away from some of the social media and the news this week and be reminding yourself of that. All right. Well, it's great to have you with us. We are in this series on the new normal, and we've been looking at lessons from the book of Acts for the church today. They were scattered people, uh, just like we are today as, as uh, the, the persecution began to attack that church right after Jesus um, had ascended and people were filled with the Spirit. They ended up being the scattered church. And we've been looking at the things and the ways in which God was working and using these disciples uh, to form his church, this new way that God was extending his kingdom in the world. It was his, God's same mission, same heart for the world, same, same all of those things that are of his values and his purposes, but he was doing it in a new way. And there's a lot that we can learn from that, even as we uh, keep saying over and over in our culture right now, this new normal, this new normal, that we're sick of hearing, we're sick of saying, and yet we, we need to take some of that to heart in our relationship with God and in the way that he is using us individually and as a church right now, because we are going to have to adjust and be flexible and do things differently. Church is going to feel and seem different to some degree for who knows how long. Well, instead of just 
you know, putting up with it or just waiting for everything to return to, quote, normals the way it was, why don't we posture ourselves and say, God, what are you wanting to do? What are you wanting to teach? What are you wanting to show me? And we're going to look at one of these stories today where God wanted to show his people, specifically his disciple Peter, something new that God was doing and doing it in a new way. And so we're going to look at that in Acts chapter 10. I rarely, uh, though I I share a lot of scripture with um, you as our church every week, as you probably know. Uh, I rarely read this much, but I'm going to read to you the entire chapter of Acts chapter 10, and we're not going to put the words up on the screen so you can just listen. It's such a great story. I think that you won't have trouble paying attention, but maybe if you are busy doing something else right now, listening to this in the background, take a moment, pause to just really focus on God's Word as I read this story to you in Acts chapter 10 about Peter and this encounter that he has with a centurion named Cornelius. So let's look at this. In Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear, as any of us would, and asked, what is it, Lord? The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon, the tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to him, had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He sent his very best. In verse 8, he told them everything that had happened, and he sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not I, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking Simon if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea, Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together all of his relatives and close friends. And as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence, bowing before him. Verse 26, Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people, all those people that Cornelius had gathered together. And Peter said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. A Gentile is someone who's just simply not a Jew, anyone who's not Jewish. God has shown me, Peter said, that I should not call though anyone impure or unclean. So he's starting to make this bridge between that vision that he saw and now these people that God had brought him to. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord commanded you to tell us. Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, 
but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit in power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God has already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to all the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed as judge of the living and dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on all Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. It's a great story. I know that's a long story, but I bet you're able to even stay engaged to that because it's a fascinating story of of what's taking place here and how God is expanding his kingdom, expanding the gospel, just as he promised the disciples that they would do. I showed you a map of this last week. I'm going to show you again, but there's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, which is mostly, mostly the northern area right above Jerusalem, and then the ends of the earth. And we're watching the gospel begin to expand, just like Jesus predicted. Now, this is brand new Um, in the sense of how God is doing this. He had always said, all the way back with Abraham, I think we said maybe in week two or week three, that God's heart was always the same. He told Abraham, I'm gonna bless you and make you a blessing so that all the families on the earth will be blessed through you. God's heart for the whole world had always been there from the very beginning until now. That is not new, but how God is gonna do it is absolutely new. He chose Abraham, and through him, his descendants, who became known as we know, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, and God is clear throughout Scripture. He told them many times, I didn't choose you because you were something special, because you were so great. In fact, God says, I'll go further and say, I chose you because you weren't so great or special, so that through you, my name, my glory, my renown would be known throughout the earth. God wanted to make himself known to all the people that lived on this earth throughout history, And the best way he knew to do that was to show himself through people since he loves his people. He loves his creation. So his heart and his desire was always to show himself through Israel. The problem was Israel, just like you and me, don't do a very good job of being an example of who God is. And and, and quite frankly, even more than that, sometimes we just decide to turn our back on him or go our own way and we don't even tell people about him. And so God in his frustration with Israel not listening and obeying to him, decided he needed to do this a different way because if Israel's not going to listen, he can't let that stop him because God's heart has been and always is for the whole world. And he knew that if he just choose, chose a different group of people other than the Jews that, that he didn't do, but we would just have a different name for them today and it would be the same story. So he decided in his, in his, in his great plans that even though this was not working out like he wanted, he still loved the Jewish people, but he's going to send his son, Jesus, And through Jesus, this would change that. And so that's what we're beginning to see is that God still wanted to reach the whole world, but because of the uniqueness of who Christ is as God's son, as fully man and fully God and dying for us, how he was going to reach the world and do that directly began to change. And this is what we're witnessing, that that the Gentiles, again, like I said, anyone who is not a Jew is now coming to know who God is in a very different way, and we're going to kind of dig into this. But what I want to look at is because this is happening now and happening so quickly and so directly, one of the issues that you could really look at throughout all of Acts, and today we're just going to stay in Acts 10, it's all that we have time for, but there's a lot of unity issues, 
A lot of of struggle as the church is growing, and not just expanding with Jewish people, but non-Jewish people. And as people are coming to know God, and they're coming from different places and different backgrounds and different kinds of people, they have lots of little struggles along the way. They're They're not doing it perfectly. Don't ever think for a moment that the early church had it all figured out and they had no issues. They had lots of problems, just like we do today. But one of the things they're really struggling with is this quick growth of expansion, not only of of the number of people that were coming to know Christ in Jerusalem, but as it expands out from there, of how do they stay unified in all this? And there's a key here. And how important is this for us right now in our culture? I don't know about you, but it, it just saddens my heart. My heart's been grieving just for our nation, for the people in our nation to watch people board up buildings and put up fences all around our country because of an election. And, and, I, and I thought, and I'm, but I'm fairly young, but I've listened to people who are much older on TV or different things talk about in their lifetime, they've never, there's been lots of unrest, lots of civil unrest, lots of unrest over racial tensions, even more so in the past than, than you probably argue we could say has happened now. Um, always different in its own context, but, but no one has said they've ever seen where we, we plan for the type of violence during an election. And, and that's a sad thing, and I've been praying, God, may this not be just the, the future of our country. God, change, change that. Don't allow that to happen. But what, what I want to say is we're, we're witnessing, we've witnessed a lot this year of the division in our nation. But listen, it's also been division in the church and division in a lot of different areas. I've, I've heard pastors who have pastored for four and five decades say they have never seen such divisiveness like they've seen right now in the church, in people's families, at work. Um, but specifically when you think about it at church, and it's not been a division over theology or a division over spiritual things, but a division in the church over politics amazing where where people these pastors have said they've never seen people leave and go to other churches so much and it have nothing to do with the gospel or Jesus but actually politics and I get it that's real for a lot of people but it's interesting to think that that our unity is supposed to come from something else and whenever our unity starts becoming about something other than Jesus we quickly, quickly fragment and become um, uh, have disunity and become divided and, and I think there's some great lessons that we can see here in the book of Acts that will challenge us today, again, in this new normal of where we're at, that we don't get off track and that we, we keep the unity focus on what, is, what unifies us. And there's this great principle that, that kicks us off right here that we just read in Acts 10 that Peter states boldly right here in the middle of the story, and he says, I now realize that God does not show favoritism. In other words, I wanted to say it this way, just to be, say it really strongly, God never functions with favoritism. In fact, it'd probably be a good thing to say right now in the midst of this election year and all the politics, God is not a partisan God. He has, he has no partisan bones in his body. He, he judges He never judges with partiality. He always judges with equality and with fairness and with with justice. Uh, It's because that's who he is. He's not a God who does justice. He is a God who is just. But this is something that Peter is, is boldly proclaiming. He's even coming to realize, we'll get to that in a few moments, but it says God never functions with favoritism. He does not favor one person over another. And that's always been the case, kind of like I said a few moments ago, that God always loved the world, but we know this has always been the case because of the way that God created both male and females. In the very beginning, he made them both in the image of God. He made them equal um, um, before him because their, their dignity and their worth was in the fact that they were made in the image of God. They were distinct from all other creation because they were made in the image of God. And, and had sin not entered in and corrupted and broke down so many things, we could have begun to live our lives and have families and grow the population of the earth and have cities, and we would have been able to respect each other and not evaluate and, and judge each other and, and lift up some and lower others and be jealous of some and slander others because we would have fully appreciated the fact that we all have equal standing, equal value before God because we remain His image. But sin broke that and marred all of that. And so one of the things that Jesus came to do was to repair that and restore it. 
Not, not to create us as equal in the sense of like, okay, now, now this is a good new thing. No, 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 but for Jesus to bring us back to how God made us from the very beginning. That's why Paul says in Galatians 3, now in Christ, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, for all of you who, who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. That's um, a way of saying something that we don't think about, but to clothe yourself with, means to, to just cover yourself. It means that who you are, anything about you that is distinct, that gives you distinction, you're, you're, the specifics about you, he says, have now been clothed with Christ over all that you are, so there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There is no ethnicity. There is neither slave nor free. There is no socioeconomic levels or, or even somebody who is rich or poor or, or greater than or less than. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. That is so key, for you are all one in Christ. We can never get there again with what sin has marred and broken us without Christ. It is only as Christ clothes us with himself that, listen, this is so important, that we don't lose our distinctions. He's not saying that, well, it doesn't matter if you're male or female anymore. No, 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 no. There is still male and female, but those distinctions do not divide us, don't separate us, don't create greater value or purpose or worth, because now in Christ, as we've been clothed in Him, we have been restored to that humanity made in God's image, now made in God's image with Jesus' righteousness because none of us were worthy of it. Jesus has made us right with God, righteous, right with God. And so we can't look at somebody else or point a finger at anybody else and think they're better than I am or God favors them or loves them more than me because it is the clothing, it is what Jesus has given us. So only, man, when we look in our societies, we look around our world or even just in our own churches, that unity is not possible without first coming to this place of who Jesus is that restores us uh, to, to the people that God created us to be made in his image um, uh, with, with all those distinctions that have now created this value system and this, this system that we function under in our world makes all that obsolete. We can't, we can't get there and have peace with one another in unity without Jesus. So, we've all been made one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And guess what? Heirs according to his promise. Not only did he remove all those things, which puts us on that, that same playing field before God, but he says that you all have an inheritance, an equal inheritance. So, anything that in this world you feel like disadvantages you, or you feel like advantages you over others. In Christ, that's all been eliminated. Everyone has now been made again equal before God and has an equal inheritance, an equal blessing that will come from God. Anybody that has children know this. And if you don't have kids, you were a kid at one time and you know that when you grow up, if you have siblings, that whenever one person gets one thing, everyone else wants the same thing. It is all about being fair. Right, and there's nothing like I have three children scooping ice cream into three bowls, and then it's like, like I mean, examiners show up, like like you would not believe, and they're looking at it to make sure that everyone's scoop is exactly the same. If we had a scale, they'd be weighing it out, I think, by the ounce to make sure that it is absolutely fair. That is just human nature. I just I don't want anybody else to have anything more than me, and we want it to be fair. In fact, if we're really honest, though, on the inside, we want to have a little bit more for us. That's why the old thing, whoever cuts it, the other gets to decide. Uh, at least in my house, nobody wanted to cut it because you wanted to be the one who decided so that you could judge which was the best or the big, biggest piece so you could choose that one for yourself. That is just our broken human nature. We just always want it to be fair. But listen, it's not again, like I said, that God in Christ has removed the distinctions, but he's taken away the advantages and the disadvantages in Christ. So Paul says it a different way in Ephesians 2, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called, quote, uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, stick with me about all that, hold on, verse 12, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
What exactly is he saying? Actually, let's make it really simple. We're not going to dive into it because it, it actually can be said in a simple way. Even the way it's put in quotes, circumcision, he's not so much talking about the physical act of that that I hope you understand what he means by that. I'm not going to go into that, but not so much the physical act of it, but in quotes saying that this is how the Jews called themselves because God had given them this sign of the covenant. And, and it was basically like, you know, you, you have to do these things and then you are a Jewish person, then you are accepted by God. And what Paul is basically saying is, hey, all of you who are not part of that in-group and every religion, every, everybody that has their own set of beliefs or religion or maybe even sometimes not a religion kind of has their set of criteria. This is what makes us distinct. This is what makes us special. Paul is basically saying those of you who are born outside of th those special requirements, he says Jesus eliminated all that. He took away that. You are no longer at a disadvantage. That's why he said, those of you who seem to be far away, those of you who would have been either looked down upon or looked down on your own thinking, oh, I'm so far away. I'm not like them. I'm not close to God like them. I wasn't born and raised like them. Paul says, nope, there's no disadvantages in Jesus anymore. There is no such disadvantage. Everything has been made on an equal playing field. So the disadvantages have been removed. And if you're someone who feels like you are far away from God or you're separated from him and you're not like other people or, or people, those goody two-shoes or those, those Christians that seem to have, no, 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 no. God does not say um, or look at you as having any sort of disadvantage. You have equal access, equal closeness, equal distance between you and God. He is right there. He is with you. And all disadvantages have been removed in Christ. But not only that, God has also taken away advantages. And we need to understand this. Romans 3, again, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 3, 22, the righteousness is given through faith. Anybody's righteousness, right standing before God, is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Here we go again. There's no favoritism. Everybody's been made equal before God. But listen, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So not only did Jesus take away all the disadvantages, listen, he also reminded us that nobody actually has an advantage, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this is really important for us. We're going to break this, this whole message down into two parts. We're just about done with the first, and then we'll look at the second. The first, it probably even says it in your Bible, the subtitle of this whole section in Acts chapter 10 was the conversion of Cornelius. And did you catch how it described Cornelius? Twice it gave kind of like his rap sheet, his, his, his resume, which is impressive. In verse one and verse 22, I mean, this guy has an impressive resume. In verse one, it said this, there's a centurion, his name's Cornelius, and he is a devout. First of all, he's a centurion, meaning he was a soldier in the Roman army and, um, and, and being over... Um, that that uh, Italian regiment or being part of that, they figured that he was over a hundred men. And um, in Caesarea, that would have been a, a good post, an impressive post. So he's someone that had risen the rank in the military. He was someone to be respected because of what he had achieved and what he had accomplished as a soldier. He was also devout, meaning that, that he lived a life that was pious, that was, that was living towards God, religious, that he was doing things, if you will, the right way. He feared God. He respected God. He, he lived before him with a, with, a, with a knowledge and an understanding. He did charitable deeds. Deeds. It said he did all kinds of great acts for the poor, and he always prayed. That's quite a list, wouldn't it? That'd be good for any of us, that, that you've accomplished a lot in your career, you, you are devout and God-fearing, you give to whoever needs it, and you're always praying. Verse 22, it's reiterated by some of his servants. He's a centurion, we know that. He's upright, very similar to devout. He lives this upright life of integrity and character. He was God-fearing, same thing. He has a good reputation, that, that kind of seems like it goes with it. And, it and, and, and in fact, he was divinely directed. This is interesting too. God spoke to him, that's why we're here. I mean, look at who this Cornelius was. I mean, that's an amazing, impressive resume. And yet, though, it was not enough. God told Cornelius in this vision, I want you to go get Peter, as the, as the servants revealed, and, and get him and bring him back. You need to hear what he has to say. So despite all of those things, listen carefully, the unity that Jesus brings is not a, is some sort of universalism, which is really popular today in a lot of religions and even in a lot of Christian seg, uh, segments of Christianity and Christian sects. 
um, that, that is kind of like, um, <clears throat> you have all different kinds of um, <clears throat> branches and segments of Christianity that, that may say, you know, well, Jesus came and he died, and so maybe if people don't really, you know, um, uh, worship God the same way we do, or they worship their own form of God, because of what Jesus did, he's brought all that in. Boy, Acts 10 makes it really clear, N- no. Here's, here's this man like Cornelius, who's God-fearing, who lives his life for God. He's a good person, doing good things, and yet it's not enough. You cannot miss this, church. You have to hear this. It is not enough. The unity is not simply in God as in some, some uh, either nameless God, or even it wasn't even enough that he was believing in the Jewish God. It's, it's not that, well, it's just good enough to do good things or give to the poor or to live a life of, of what you would call integrity or character. It wasn't enough. God told Cornelius, you need to hear from Peter. And Peter comes, and immediately Cornelius, it says he fell down, right, to worship him. And Peter says, get up, get up, get up. And then Peter's next uh, soon after statement is, wow, I'm realizing that God doesn't show favorites, meaning like he's accepting you Gentiles just like he is Jews. And uh, one, one um, uh, commentator, John Stott, said, I, I thought this was a great line, he said, Peter refused both to be treated by Cornelius as if he was a god, but yet also to treat, not to treat Cornelius as if he was a dog, because Jewish people in those days really looked down on people who were not Jews. That was just common. That was a prejudice they had. It was, it was, it was, it was ugly that it kind of come from their nation of God wanting to make them distinct in a way to draw people to them. They used against other people, never how God intended. And so they looked down on others, and he realized in that day, I'm no one special, only Jesus is, and guess what? These people are just as special before God as I am, neither a God nor a dog. It is not about people. It's not about men and women. It is about Jesus, which is why it wasn't enough that that Cornelius was such a good person. Acts 10, 34 goes on to say, God doesn't show favoritism. He accepts every nation, um, the one who fears him and does what is right, right? We read this. You know the message God sent to all the people of Israel announcing the good news, excuse me, Announcing the good news of peace to Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So Peter then, as he meets Cornelius and says these things, begins to preach to him and all his family. Family, All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him, Jesus, receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Interestingly, as soon as Peter gets to the point in his sermon that he says, you must believe in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, it says in verse 46, while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message and and Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being saved, uh, or all who heard the message. And it says they, I, I'm sorry, I didn't put it in my notes, or skipped over that verse, but they all began to speak in tongues. They began to praise God. Peter witnessed this and said, oh my goodness, they're doing exactly what happened when we were filled with the Holy Spirit. So he finishes with verse 47, surely no one can stand in the way of them being baptized now with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Here's what I want you to catch, church. Even though he was devout, even though he was a wonderful man and he gave, you know, gifts to the poor and Cornelius was this just amazingly good person, he still needed forgiveness from Jesus Christ. Our unity as a church is not based upon what we do or who we are or what others even think of us. He, was, he had such a good reputation. It is solely on the grace that has been given to us as our sins have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. We cannot forget that. But it also is a great encouragement to us and also a challenge for those of us who are in the church that that is the most important thing. And that's why there's two parts of the story. The first part is this this conversion of Cornelius, this great God-fearing, respectable person but still needed the forgiveness of Jesus. The second part is the conversion of Peter. And I would argue personally that the story is more about Peter's conversion than it was even Cornelius. Peter knew that God wanted to reach the world. That wouldn't have been new to him, and he would want to reach the Gentiles, all those who were not Jewish, who were not Jews. But he never believed that it would be directly to them, that God would go directly to Gentiles and just go and bypass the Jewish people and all that, um, their history and, and what God had taught them. He, he'd never imagined that they wouldn't need to become a Jew, they wouldn't have to, to um, follow any of the Jewish uh, laws or customs, but that God would go directly to him. And this is what he's beginning to realize. Listen, in verse 14, remember the vision that Peter had. 
He said he saw the sheet coming down to contain all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not I, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And now while Peter was still thinking about this vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs and don't hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. First of all, I don't know if you caught this early on in Acts chapter 10 when I read it the first time, but do you remember how it said that Peter went up in the middle of the day, um, they, they think this was around noon, to pray, and it says he got hungry. Isn't it wonderful to know that like one of the main disciples, that when he goes and tries to dedicate himself to prayer, all he can think about is eating. Does that happen to anybody else other than me? I mean, come on. I mean, you can even put that online right now. Like, like what do you crave most when you decide you want to start praying? <laughs> but what's even worse is if you want to start fasting and praying, you, you are guaranteed someone's going to call you or text you or email you immediately and say, hey, can I take you out to lunch today? You're like, oh, man. There's something about whenever that begins to happen. Not only did he get hungry, but he got tired. Anybody else? Right? Oh, every time I go to pray, I just end up kind of falling asleep or I, I kind of, I get distracted because I'm hungry or something else is going on. That should make us all feel better, first of all. That, that, that the disciple Peter, who is even with Jesus and saw all that he did, when he goes to pray, he gets hungry, he gets distracted, he gets sleepy, and he's thinking about anything other than praying. But yet, God begins to give him this vision. And he gives him this vision of these animals and, and um, just the short recap of that is some of those animals would have been considered unclean in, the, in part of Jewish custom. God had told them originally, don't eat from those animals. But now because of Jesus, everything has changed. And he's wanting Peter to understand this. But it's not about the animals, it's not about his diet. It's about people. As Peter began to realize, when we read that a moment ago, he said, oh, now I'm realizing that vision wasn't just about animals, it was about people as he showed up at Cornelius' house. And, he, and God has begun to take him. But listen, even Peter again, not only is he hungry, not only is he falling asleep, but it said God gave him the vision three times. Anytime that something happens three times in the Bible, that's always for importance and emphasis. But I also think, just to be real with human nature, God also had to tell Peter three times. Anybody else like a three-time person Christian that God has to tell three times? Yes. Like, I told you once, I'm telling you again finally maybe you'll hear me now. It just makes me feel better that God had to give him this vision three times and he says, listen. And then they finally show up and he says, Simon, there's men looking for you. Get up and go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with them. That word hesitate, I'm not saying that's a wrongly translated, but it comes from a Greek word that means to hesitate, but really it means to do not discriminate. The hesitation is more of the result of it. Don't, don't pause in doubt or hesitation, meaning what he told Peter is, don't discriminate, don't prejudge the situation and who's at your door. I want you to go with them. I'm telling you to go with them. And this was the challenge, and this is what God was doing with Peter. And this is, this is where I want us to go as we finish up this morning, is to those of us, not like Cornelius, that maybe are, are good people but really need to know Jesus. And some of you, you needed to hear that earlier. But then there's the rest of us that know Jesus. But listen, it's not enough to just continue on and think, I've got it all, I've got it all figured out. God is always wanting to do a new thing in us and give us fresh eyes and fresh vision for things that he's doing. But how do you know if it's him? How do you know? How do you guard it? Because it's always around Christ. It's always centered on him. And, and God is wanting to teach Peter a brand new lesson here in a new way that he's reaching the Gentile world. And he tells him, I don't want you to, to discriminate. Just go and trust me. And that's why Peter says in verse 34, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Peter was beginning to break out of, you know what? This is the way it works. This is the way I worship. This is the way we approach God. And because he is listening to God and moving, allow God to move his spirit, he's beginning to realize, oh, wait just a minute. And listen, we all need to hear this. Just because this is the way that I come to Christ, this is the way that I like to worship, or this is the way that God works in my life, it's not the only way. But how do we guard against it? Remember, it's the same thing as we just talked about with Cornelius, because it's centered on Jesus. It's centered on Christ, but whenever we find someone who says, yes, I believe in Jesus, I know that he's God's son, and that I'm saved because of my forgiveness of sins, we know that that's the most important part of unity. And if we can center our lives on that, we can allow ourselves to even learn and grow more of how God is, is meeting and doing things in the world. But sometimes we get stuck doing things the way that we want. The safeguard is always that it's centered on Christ. 
But when we know that, then, then God can move us just like he did with Peter. Because he's not teaching Peter something new. He's not moving away from the central tenets and beliefs of the faith or of who God is. But what he's challenging is this, and I, and I, I, I said this um, in my notes for you, that first point was that God doesn't show favoritism, but simply the second thing is this. God may not show favoritism, but he is not neutral. He is on our side. And I want us to finish with this today and understand this, that Peter is beginning to realize, oh, okay, yeah, God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't show favorites. But even more than that, God is reaching out and loving this Gentile world for us today in our own context. These people that are not like me and, and don't do things like me and maybe I don't always agree with, with what they believe. Think about it. This was a Roman. So you're talking just like some of the things that might challenge us. His politics, God might be different. His views might be different towards, towards um, you know, uh, his culture or his family or these other things. And God is saying, but listen, what is important is this man is seeking after me and he is ready to receive my son, Jesus. And so go and trust in that. But that was, that was gonna mean having to overcome a lot of hurdles for Peter. And, but that's a good challenge for us to remember today that unity is around Jesus. And we cannot find unity around other things. It is around him first and foremost and learning how to overcome those things. And I, I want to close with this because I think this is interesting. Luke makes a point several times in Acts chapter 10 to say that Peter was in Joppa and he describes where he was there in, the, in, in Simon's house. And Joppa's mentioned a couple times in Scripture, but really only one time really famously, especially in the Old Testament. Caesarea is on the coast of the Mediterranean, just a little north of Joppa. It's a little south. It's kind of directly over west, a little north from Jerusalem still today. You can go there to the ancient city of Joppa. There's another town there, a modern town. But, but Joppa, I don't know if you can think of this, but there's another famous person, a prophet in the Old Testament that ended up in Joppa. His name was Jonah. And I don't know if you know the story of Jonah. But there was a, a, a prophet that God spoke to and said, Jonah, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh was the ancient capital of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was known to be ruthless, terrible, terrible. You think of, of um, um, I mean, just the worst terrorist groups you can imagine, right? I mean, just horrible. And, and the Assyrians probably made them look nice. I mean, they were terrible, and they loved to flaunt how evil and, how, and full of hate they were. And, and God told Jonah, I want you to go to the capital city of Nineveh. And Jonah is like, I don't want to go. But here's the thing. He reveals later, he didn't want to go because he was afraid or, or that, or um, he, he was worried of what they may do to him, or, or just simply because he didn't like them. And he hated him and didn't want to be near him. That's, why, that's not why Judah or Jonah refused to go. It says that he refused to go because Jonah said, God, I knew if I went there and I told them about you, they would repent and you would save them and I hate them and I didn't want them to be saved. So what did Jonah do? He went to the city of Joppa and he found a ship heading to Tarshish, which would be on the other side of the Mediterranean and he was trying to get as far away from God's presence as he possibly could because he did not have a heart to see God reach them and be merciful and, grace of, and gracious to them that they would be saved. So he headed to Joppa to leave. Now, I think it's interesting. Of course, I believe that Jesus really fulfilled the, the role of Jonah that he didn't fulfill and, and actually went and reached a world that was lost and broken and was an enemy of God. And, and he didn't go into the belly of a well, but, but went into the ground for three days and rose again and gave us life. And I think Jesus is the ultimate for fulfillment of that. But I also think that Luke is trying to draw attention to something, that because of Jesus, Things have now changed. There's a new understanding, a new revelation that should be happening in the people of God and in their hearts. And so God finds Peter in Joppa and he comes to him in a very similar way as he did to Jonah. This time not saying go to the capital of Assyria, Nineveh, but he tells Peter, I want you to go to a Roman in those days, a Roman would have been just like an Assyrian in the eyes of the Jewish people. This hated group, this nation that had just suppressed and beaten and been evil to the Jewish people. And he says, I want you to go to Roman. And not just a Roman, I want you to go to a centurion. You know, those, those soldiers who were part of who killed Jesus, who, comes, who came against him and your people for all these years and have slaughtered you. And I want you to go find this Roman, this centurion, 
He doesn't, Peter doesn't know this right now, but he, he knows as he's on his way, I'm going to Caesarea, I'm going to this Roman, the centurion, because the servants had told him, and he's wanting, and God, I want you to tell them about me. And here's the big difference, it's amazing. Instead of leaving Joppa and fleeing, he goes to Caesarea, which was the capital of that area of Rome, that's where the governor of that province would have been. And so there's so many parallels, but instead of Peter leaving and saying, God, I don't want to see you reach these people and be gracious, Peter's heart had been changed by Jesus. And he said, you know what, I'm gonna go. And we see this, I think, come out in 2 Peter, the, one of the couple books that Peter wrote, 2 Peter 3. Listen to how Peter ended up his life at the very end, verse eight, sharing this with this church that he wrote to. He says, I don't want you to forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He was talking to this group of people that had been suffering under major persecution. And he says, I know you're wondering, where is God, and why hasn't he changed this, and why hasn't he shown up? Why has God seemed to be so slow? And he says, I want you to understand one thing. With a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day with God. But what he's really saying is this. I know it seems like God is not showing up and he's taking a long time, but he says, I just know this about God, that if he's waiting on anything, he's waiting for everyone to come to know him. He's not, because he doesn't want anyone to perish. So God may not show favorites. He may not advantage or disadvantage people over against each other, but he's not neutral. Understand that today. God is for each of us. He desires that none should perish, and Peter got this. And I pray in this new normal of, of, of the day in which we live right now that our hearts would not be like Jonah, who would just say, you know what, I don't like that people, I don't like those groups of people, I don't even know if I want God to meet them, but our hearts would be like Peter, whose heart was changed by God because he felt God and knew that God forgave him and gave him grace. And so he, unlike Jonah, went to the people that he would have been very prejudiced against, very much disliked, and said, you know what, if their hearts are right before God and they want to accept Jesus, then I want to welcome them in. In fact, it's beautiful. It's a simple thing, but it's beautiful. At the very end of Acts 10, it said that Peter stayed with them three days. There's a lot of actually power in that last statement because it meant he just went and he ate with them and he lived with them. And he actually fulfilled that declaration that God said, don't call unclean anything that I've made clean. But church, for us to do this, and as we close, for us to do this, we have to be willing to let God do something new in us. Peter had to overcome his own self-righteousness and begin to realize that, you know what? God didn't love him or was gonna use him or advantage him in any way greater than someone else. That God was reaching out to everyone in the world. That's why I really believe that this story is more about the conversion of Peter than it really is Cornelius. God would have met Cornelius and done something amazing in his life no matter what, but God didn't want Peter to miss out on how God was gonna reach the world and to also just enlarge Peter's heart of how big and how much God's grace and love covers this world. So, so people, listen to me today. Oh, all of you, God loves you so much. I wanna go back to that last verse in Acts 10, 15. It says, the voice said to Peter, what God has made clean, do not call impure. Let's close by just thinking of these simple things. What God has made clean, do not call impure. Listen. What that statement first says, number one, is that Jesus, uh, God through Jesus, is the only way that any of us become clean. And if you're here today and you've been listening to this, and maybe you would characterize yourself in some way like Cornelius, that you've tried really hard, you've done well, and you've given to the poor, you've, you've done whatever, you have a list of a resume you think that makes you good enough, listen carefully and see the, the verse in the scripture that says, that was not enough for Cornelius and it won't be enough for you. All of that God honored and, and he appreciated and he loved about Cornelius, but Cornelius still had to come to a place of accepting who Jesus was and the forgiveness of his sins that he was not enough on his own, that he never could be, that he could never become clean or right before God enough on his own. Only Jesus can do that. And if you're here today, God is willing to do that and accept you and, and cleanse you of your sins. We want to help you in that process. You can go to our website, go to our Connect card, fill that out. We will get in touch with you and help you as you begin that journey with God. But it's as simple as just having to make that acknowledgement, just like Cornelius that says, God, forgive me. I'm realizing that I'm not enough on my own. I'm not good enough on my own. 
And if you're ready to do that today, God will welcome you and receive you. But lastly, the, the, the couple things to finish up too is that, listen, do not call something impure that Jesus has made clean. That there's some of you, honestly, have given your life to Jesus and you let the enemy beat you down all the time, constantly, that you're still not clean, that you're not pure, but God has cleansed you through Jesus and you need to trust him. In fact, close your eyes with me as I just finished in this prayer, but I wanna pray for you. Lord, help people today that just, they feel just still so broken, so dirty, so sinful, and they've not come to the realization that you have cleansed them. Lord, may we have that realization like Peter, that if you have cleaned us, that we are clean in Jesus' name. And may they know that. But then lastly, God, as we close, (laughs) Lord, today if our hearts have become more like Jonah than like Peter's, Lord, forgive us. May we not look and, and, and discriminate and judge people before we know if their hearts are longing to know you and wanting to know you and are ready to receive Jesus. May we not uh, show favoritism, God, because you don't. May we not discriminate ahead of time, but open up our hearts to whatever you wanna do and whoever you wanna do it and always be ready for that. Lord, that our unity is in you, Jesus, and in nothing more than that. I thank you for that today. In your name we pray. Amen, amen. We're gonna close as we do with one final song. Maybe you stand to your feet and let's sing about the goodness of God as we close our, our time today. God bless you.
you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. And before you go, we have this quick video. Please watch this. All right, we'll see you next week. If you made a decision today to follow Jesus or put him in charge of your life, or if you're interested in knowing exactly what that means, we invite you to go to the bottom of our website and fill out what we call a connect card. We would love to walk with you as you grow in your relationship with God, and we're so glad you were able to join us for worship today.